For hundreds of years, there was a tradition, sadly largely forgotten, of whiling away the long dark winter nights by huddling around a blazing fire and telling ghost stories. Elizabethan playwright Christopher Marlowe wrote of telling winter tales of spirits and ghosts that glide by night. Here are three seasonal tales for the holidays. Our first story takes us to a haunted road in Somerset, located in the West Country. Winter weather and storms would often make country roads unfit for purpose, and highwaymen were a threat to those travelling by horse, stagecoach and even by foot. Many people were unable to afford a journey by horse, and would set out to walk for miles to reach their location. Superstition was rife. Many would not set out after sunset for fear of attack or a chance meeting with a spirit. Local clergymen were avid walkers, and in 1847, local preacher Thomas Taylor March began his journey from West Chinook to Crewkern, a journey of roughly four miles. It was a bitterly cold night, and snow had just started to fall. He knew if he increased his pace, he'd be home very soon. As he walked, he saw the figure of a young woman sitting alone in the centre of the road. Thinking this was odd, he remembered the encounter well. He wrote, She was wearing a loose white dress. She was engaged in combing her hair on the right side of her head, and her face was turned to the left. I slowly approached her, paused, and explained she'd chosen a cold berth. Receiving no response, I bade her good night and continued on. A little way further, I looked back and saw her in the same place, combing her hair. My first thought was that she was from a party of young people, celebrating the festive cheer, and that she was a very silly lark. I berated myself for not rendering assistance, and when I got home, I related the circumstances to my wife. I spoke to many in the neighbourhood who thought it was a practical joke. Another witness, 19 years earlier, seemed to have witnessed the same apparition. He recalled, Afraid to face the figure any longer, I tore myself away at the top of my speed, which I did not relax until fairly out of breath. Whilst I ploughed through the slush, I heard a woman's wailing voice borne along by the boisterous wind. Oh, why does he not come? It later emerged that Ellen, the only daughter of a local farmer, had arranged to marry at Christmas some years before. A month before the wedding, her fiancé, Harry Gill, had been thrown from his horse and killed. This shocking news drove Ellen insane and her lifeless body was found floating in a nearby pool of water, dressed in a white nightdress and gripping a comb in her hand. The next story centres on the White Hart Inn public house which was located on Paradise Street, Birmingham, close to the town hall before redevelopment in the 1960s. Emily Palmer was the wife of Thomas Palmer, landlord of the White Hart and several other local inns. Well known to the locals, considered friendly and respectable, the incidents of December the 27th, 1884, both stunned and devastated the local community. Emily's best friend was Harriet, a trustworthy companion who lived as the common law wife of Henry Kimberley. Their relationship had lasted 17 years, but was becoming strained. 
Harriet, becoming increasingly unhappy as time went by, confided in her friend that she wanted out. A court settlement was reached for the couple's possessions. Harriet got the house and most of the couple's belongings. Henry got £20 and a piano. Bitterly angry and furious with Harriet's rejection, Henry was determined to win his lover back. He began to follow her and send her letters, pleading for her to return. His pursuit was relentless, but alas to no avail. Harriet was not interested at all. On the 27th of December, Harriet visited her friend Emily for a Christmas tipple and a catch-up at the White Hart Inn. Moments later, a somewhat drunk and desperate Henry staggered over to the two girls. Henry begged one more time for Harriet to return and the answer yet again was a thumping no. Henry flew into rage, grabbed a revolver from his coat and shot Harriet at point-blank range. She fell to the floor, with blood spilling from a bullet wound to her head. Desperate to help Harriet, Emily cradled her friend and tried to revive her. Henry shot Emily in the chest. A scuffle ensued, with the barman detaining Henry before he could inflict any more damage. Luckily, Harriet survived as the bullet grazed her but didn't enter her skull. However, it was too late for her friend Emily. She died of her wounds three days later. Henry Kimberley was found guilty of murder. On March the 17th, 1885, he was hanged at Winson Green Prison, the first person to be hanged in Birmingham for 79 years. Just before the white cap was put on, he exclaimed, God have mercy on my soul. Thousands of people lined the route of Emily's funeral. Three years later, Thomas Palmer died and was buried with Emily. Until 2015, the location of the White Hart was occupied by a small arcade of shops and restaurants known as Fletcher's Walk. The dark and dishevelled apparition of Henry Kimberley has been spotted in this arcade, desperately pacing, frantically looking for Harriet. In 2017, Fletcher's Walk was demolished to make way for a new development. Will Henry Kimberley's guilty, restless soul reappear or finally vanish? For hundreds of years, mining communities across the country held deep belief in superstition and ghosts. Many tales of spirits and ghosts were passed down verbally from generation to generation and were taken very seriously. Dowsing rods were often used to locate ore in the underground veins. It was forbidden to whistle below ground as the naive belief was that it would drive away the ore, almost like a timid animal. In the past, when water pumping equipment malfunctioned, Miners attributed the blame to witchcraft and would lay rowan branches on top, hoping this would weaken the strength of the witch. This is partly because each berry has a small five-pointed star, or pentagram, opposite its stalk. The hazardous nature of mining meant that omens and superstitions were believed to be signals from God. If a miner should see a rabbit on their way to work, they should be wary this animal indicated an accident was imminent. 
In the Derbyshire Peak District village of Bradwell, a large black dog crossed the path of a miner who became overwhelmed with fear. Convinced of its unlucky reputation, he refused to enter the mine. His friend, who also witnessed the dog insisted on business as usual, entered the mine and was killed when the roof caved in. The mine itself was said to be the home of ghosts, elves and spirits who were blamed for disasters and incidents in or near the mines. Derbyshire lead miners believed in spirits nicknamed the knockers, whose ancient hammers could be heard tapping deep within the fabric of the mine. This extract from a poem by Henry Walker explains. The miner's blood turned cold. It was the spectre of the mine. A sudden crash and fall of rocks. The miner met his doom. The shining ore he vainly sought now glistened on his tomb. In lead miner's lore is written, let those who can define, why none may live that look upon the spectre of the mine. Not all mining spirits are thought to be evil though. Toad man of the lead mines of the Peak District lives in the dark, dangerous underground world of the miners, especially in abandoned mines. This historical figure of lead mining folklore is thought to be a collective spirit of both ancestral miners and the very mines themselves. Toad Man was regarded with great respect and revered as a guardian spirit of the ancient lead mines. Every Christmas Eve, as the miners left to celebrate with family and loved ones, the Bradwell miners gave thanks to this precious spirit of the mine. They'd leave a candle burning and many offerings and trinkets, including tiny clay pipes and children's shoes and clothes, as a gift for this protective entity, desperately hoping for his protection when they returned to work after the festivities were over. <laughs>